welcome, Coleman. Thank you very much for joining us. We're going to have the discussion about the fourth industrial revolution and where companies are at the moment. But yeah, thank you very much for joining us. All good, Hardis. Thank you very much for the invitation. I think we have uh, exciting challenges on our hands, not only with the fourth industrial revolution, but also the situation we find ourselves in with COVID currently. So um, I've been working in information technology for the initial 20 years of my career and really started off in engineering. I happened to be one of the first um, South, in South Africa, one of the first um, ladies in the engineering field, so specifically looking after what we know from that time called PC land. So everything that was within one single building before we started to look at the connectivity uh, between buildings. So that was way back when in 1997 and um, subsequently moved to, through the ranks um, in terms of project management, then into key account management um, and looking at revenue assurance and the creation of a department there and then into strategy execution. And then I started to realize that along the way, I had a lot of people that were giving back to me in some way in terms of their mentorship, uh, whether that be their time or whether that be sharing of their knowledge, which really got me to the career that I have built over time. And I felt that it was absolutely necessary to try and find a way to incorporate that in the South African context in terms of internships and learnerships within the workplace. So I've been working quite closely with an information technology company based in South Africa, where we've been looking at how we can utilize my brain-based coaching skills, as well as my technology experience, to really have a look at how we can address the unemployment challenges that we have in South Africa. So that's very much where I find myself today, is moving from a technology focus to technology as an enabler, and very much focusing on the individual within the context of the organization and their workplace readiness to secure them employment and also start building their career, which I had the privilege of being mentored and coached uh, through my initial 20 years. Okay, so in, in your opinion, like we know that businesses needs to, you know, in the past we told them, um, you know, prepare for the fourth industrial revolution, prepare for the digital world. And most companies back then, they, you know, they heard this, but they didn't really action, action it to prepare and adopt to such an environment. Can you maybe out of your opinion, tell us, um, you know, how, how do you think a business need to adapt and change um, regarding the fourth industrial revolution and the digital world and the 21st century skills that the employees need? And, and how do they, you know, in a, let's call it a perfect world, how will they prepare for such a for such a for such an environment where they where they actually pushed into now um, in, instead of you know phasing it in gradually. Yeah, sure. So I think there's a couple of aspects to to cover uh, related to the technology, uh, the actual organisation, and then also you know the the person within that context. So I think firstly, if we just start off with recapping what you know the fourth industrial revolution is, the World Economic Forum really provides us with a lot of information. But it's really, it's the current period that we're living in. Many people are currently questioning whether we maybe haven't fast-tracked the fourth industrial revolution to the fifth industrial revolution, which is very much more purpose orientated. And I'll touch on that towards the end when we talk about you know, sustainability and what's in it for us, not only as organizations, but as individuals, what does that future possibly look like? So we've got speed of change, scale, you know, this, it's a force unlike anything we've ever experienced. You know, the Time magazine recently talks about this being the biggest worldwide uh, remote working experiment. If you think of how many people have been forced to start to adopt technology, and it maybe also questions in a large way our readiness from a digital literacy perspective. So we're having radical system-wide innovation, and it can happen in only a few years. We'll talk a bit about exponential organizations and how that's actually happening 10 times faster than any other organization in that industry. So we're seeing this continuous interplay between fields like nanotechnology, brain research, 3D printing, the, you know, the increase of speed and availability of data from a mobile networks perspective. And it's really a reality that previously was unthinkable. So the access to technology is absolutely spreading like wildfire. And it's becoming exceptionally cheap for people to invent 
new products and services. But we also need to consider how our business models need to change, and it's affecting every industry. But at the same time, we're faced with a world of increased unemployment, potential impact to productivity, and inequality. So that's very much looking at the fourth industrial revolution and what it brings to us. But if we consider the things that business needs to do to adapt to it, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And I'd like, you, like to just take you through some of these questions. So for example, a board and an executive team need to fully understand the economics of digital platform business models. There needs to be this co-creation between optimizing the legacy, but also inventing the future. So it's questionable in terms of whether we're creating this ambidextrous organization that is allowing equal power and status in terms of focusing on both of these worlds. There's definitely a requirement for new metrics in terms of how we measure or guide business. There also needs to be this independent portfolio of old and new business models. And we really need to be reconceiving business's purpose within the fourth industrial revolution. So it starts to consider things like, do we have the leadership that we require in an organization that has the combination of vision, digital experience, and to drive fundamental change from the top within an incumbent business? But what are we doing in terms of collaboration? Are we leveraging proven tech entrepreneurs to build new digital ventures that are strategically aligned to our business? What does that potentially look like? So to answer the, the second part to your question around the fourth industrial revolution and the world that businesses need to prepare for, we've already seen how these technologies are starting to come into our day in terms of the challenges that we experience with COVID-19, the use of video conferencing, not only to check in on patient health, for us to continue to work remotely, to remain connected to society and to individuals. We've continued to see a great shift from in-person learning or contact learning to the need to use digital platforms to do so. And we've seen how 3D printing has been leveraged to help with some of the equipment that is required during the pandemic that we are experiencing currently. But overall, we need to be looking at how these technologies are creating disruption across the entire value chain. And what disruption is coming from agile and innovative competitors, because we all now have access to global digital platforms for research, development, marketing, sales, and distribution. And consumer behavior is changing. There's new patterns in terms of how we need to adapt the way that we design, market, deliver our products and services. So we really need to be thinking about how do we serve our clients? How do we deal with the talent, the culture, and organizational forms definitely requires some rethought. So how does earlier on I mentioned about exponential organizations? And there's a very interesting interesting movement to have a look at called Open EXO, which are helping organizations through agile methodologies, specifically sprints, to have a look at how they can get to market quicker and what are they trying to achieve. As we have this abundance of technology, we also have to have a look at how do we leverage all this access to information to be able to craft products that we can get to the market quickly, but is also serving the needs of the consumer. So at first, these products and services that become digitalized can be deceptive in terms of their growth because it can appear that it grows slowly, but at a certain point in time, they skyrocket when they hit that tipping point. But more importantly, we also need to take the generations into consideration that are now entering the workplace. They're very dissatisfied by their professional careers not having a positive impact in the world. We often talk about the millennials and how they are very purpose orientated. So what is our organizations doing to make a positive impact on the world and not just doing this for profit? And I think that touches on the initial 
components, but the impact on people is going to be immense, as we are already seeing. Not only is this going to affect what we do, but it's also fundamentally going to affect who we are. It's going to affect our identity in terms of our sense of privacy, our notions of ownership, our consumption of patterns, the time we devote to our work and our leisure. There's recently a stat being shared that currently with remote working, in terms of COVID, there's a 34% time increase with individuals that are working remotely. So where do we establish these boundaries that in the past we might have experienced through having to sit in the traffic and make our way home to our families? How do we continue to develop our careers and cultivate our skills, meet people, and very importantly, how do we keep our relationships intact in terms of the interaction that we have? So it's important for us also to look at how we take the time to pause, reflect, and engage in those meaningful conversations, understand our challenging environment, challenge our assumptions, and continuously innovate. Yeah, I totally agree with you there, Carmen. Um, you know, the, there's a, this operational aspect. And then, you know, speaking to a couple of clients this, this last month or two, I can get a feeling that, um, you know, they get, they get not scared, but they get anxious about their employees. And, you know, um, the change management that needs to happen inside a corporation or a company to be able to make these changes. You know, it's almost like in a school where you change the whole pedagogy of way of working and everything. Um, so that comes to that come, comes to my next question, and and um, this is really what what in your opinion need a company to have in place, um, you know, to minimize risk and to make sure that you know um, out of your experience with the brain and the neuroscience and and, and neuroplasticity, what do the company needs to do to you know minimize that anxiety from the employees, and you know, of give them a a, a way of developing a growth mindset in a, in a way, you know, to take this and, and see the opportunity in this. Because like you just said, the millennials, you know, they're a different generation that, that wants to do new things and wants to be challenged in that way. They need to create new things and everything. So for them, it won't be such a different um, kind of way of working, but still, the, you know, the, your whole corporation or your whole workforce needs to adapt a, a growth mindset at the end of the day. And how, in your opinion, should a company position itself and make sure that they can achieve that by the end of the day? Yeah, absolutely, Hadis. So, so we know from a brain insight perspective, the brain has an organizing principle which either puts us in a threat or reward state. And right now, with the mere fact that we have this large degree of uncertainty, our threatened state is heightened. And that threatened state that is heightened is exactly the same as how your brain perceives pain. So our brain craves the need for certainty. And for us to gain that certainty, it comes down to how we communicate. So we really need very strong leadership in these uncertain times. But also as we move from one industrial revolution into the next, if we can create certainty, we can dampen the anxiety that we experience as individuals. Currently with COVID, we also have a situation where our autonomy, so our, our ability to choose or freedom has been taken from us with being in a position of lockdown. But also our relatedness. It's a lot harder for us if relatedness is an important social driver for us to relate to individuals in the manner that we were able to do before. Because we are only able to read a limited amount of gestures, whether that be through a telephonic call or whether that be through video conferencing. So I think as an organization, you really need to take a very specific change approach, would be, which would be things like looking at what you aspire towards achieving, assessing that current reality versus that future vision, looking at how you align your workforce as well as how you execute within your organization, but at the same time to engage and reward and it very much speaks about a culture of inclusion. There are four different types of leaders that they're currently saying will do exceptionally well within these circumstances. 
And it's those that are, have the ability to stand out by doing good. So they really look at the social initiatives that are fundamental to business. And also those that have the ability to overcome challenges using data-focused approaches to strategic decision-making. But at the same time, also preparing employees for digital transformation. So investing in the employee and retraining them for the future of work. These things are absolutely critical. But coming back to a growth mindset and developing a growth mindset, Dr. Carol Dweck did a lot of research around a growth mindset in the school schooling environment and realized that some children were really getting excited about difficult problems while others were getting anxious. And she started to, to formulate her research in more detail around a fixed mindset where you feel threat versus a growth mindset where you feel challenged. So for example, in a fixed mindset, I might be saying, what if I'm not good enough? But in a growth mindset, I'd be saying, I can get better. So really looking at in the one mindset you're proving and in the other mindset you're improving. In the one you're demonstrating your skills and in the other you're developing your skills. In the one you're performing better than others and in the other you're performing better than you did before. So it's really about the power of not yet. And there are a number of um, questionnaires that you can run through in terms of assessing what type of mindset you're finding yourself in at a certain period of time. I think an important point here is whether you have a fixed mindset or whether you have a growth mindset is circumstantial. So it's important to understand that there are some situations where you might feel stretching beyond my comfort zone is risky, which is more fixed mindset orientated. But stretching beyond my comfort zone is a way to improve my abilities. So I think through leveraging off how we speak to each other, we have the ability to start to understand what are those beliefs that are limiting potential growth. But in an organizational context, it's also important for us to start to leverage a culture of a growth mindset. And the Neuroleadership Institute shares a very good case study in regards to adopting a growth mindset within Microsoft. Microsoft states we want to be not a know-it-all, but a learn-it-all organization. And it's very much about starting to leverage and learn from failure. So it's about rewarding and not feeling threatened by failure. And a few key aspects that you could look at to establish a growth mindset culture is to make certain that your systems enable the right behaviors, to ensure that your top leaders' engagement and commitment towards that growth mindset culture. Measure and track and measure again, but be clear and intentional about it creating that mindset. How does, does that give you some more insight? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and and I like the fact that you said in some circumstances you can have a fixed mindset and in some circumstances you can have a growth mindset because, um, yeah, um, the growth mindset, in my opinion, will be very important in this stage. And, and I agree with you when you say that leadership in the company needs to provide and create and actually nurture a, a culture of um, growth mindset. And, um, you know, companies can, I spoke to a couple of companies this last month or so that asked me, okay, how this, this is, this is, you know, this is, this is brilliant and I like the information, but what can we do right now, you know, uh, to, to mitigate risk and to, to, to see a, uh, you know, a sustainable future for this company. And, um, you know, that comes back to your, what you said about upskilling yourself and staying relevant. I always make the, um, the the example of you know a company that works on paper based uh, facts and everything, and then and then you know some someday they need to go on digital and computerizing and everything in the company, and the the employee itself will just say yeah, but the company didn't um, give me opportunity to upskill. But in my opinion, it is where the employee needs to stay relevant and you know try and upskill themselves. But it must be, I think, from a company point of view, is it must be a culture of um, let's keep our workforce relevant and upskilled 
and the necessary training. Um, my yeah, that comes to this question, Carmen, that I have for you. It's 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 what's the new normal? You know, everybody speak about if you if you see if you see someone, you say yeah, what will our new normal be? And especially in the um, you know, according to the fourth industrial revolution, skills and the soft skills that we need um, to thrive in the fourth industrial revolution, um, especially for companies. What do you think will that entitle entitles to be you know in a, to be upskilled and and to learn new, um, let's call it necessary skills for the to to thrive in such an uh, environment. Well, so Hadis, it's a fantastic question because I think that there's a lot of potential speculation on what a new normal could look like. I joined a very interesting um, webinar earlier this week, and it was really talking about us not asking why, but starting to ask how, for us to start looking at how we can collaborate, whether that be with diverse thinking, or whether it be in groups that we are comfortable that create some form of famili familiarity. The most important thing is that with the current pandemic, we know that there's a certain amount of shift that is going to happen. It's accelerating technology as an enabler. Now, we are already seeing the inclusion of technology in the future of education. And I was looking at some of your offerings as CTU and you're very well positioned in terms of looking at not only online training, but also your hybrid offering. Because in the context of South Africa, we also still have certain prohibitors. And we need to have a look at how we have a multinodal delivery mechanism. But we must also not underestimate that we could have challenges in terms of digital literacy, in terms of teaching skills, our learner competency, and also emotional well-being with the situation we find ourselves in currently. So some of the potential new normals that have been discussed in the future of education in a recent Gibbs forum was that we're looking at a different type of educator and also a different type of learner, but we must not discredit accessibility and also that adoption of technology in the education sector has always been lagging. So if we think about the World Economic Forum and some of the skills that they are referring to are required in 2020, where we find ourselves today, we have complex problem solving and critical thinking, also creativity, and I would argue not people management, but people leadership. Our ability to coordinate with others would also be a strong skill. And I think emotional intelligence, we specifically need to be looking at empathy as well as compassion so getting an understanding of what we are experiencing. Then we need to look at how do we move from that state of anxiousness to being able to gain focus so that we can have a more solution oriented decision making. Because the reality is, is that we're finding ourselves often in a very irrational state because of the overwhelm and the anxiety that comes with the pandemic. And we really need to have a service orientation. Let's not forget who our clients are. And at the same time, let's ensure that our employees are skilled accordingly to be able to fulfill the service needs, even in the time we find ourselves. But I would argue that one of the one or two of the key skills currently required is resilience and agility. Resilience, not only in terms of the emotional elements where we need to be able to bounce back, acknowledge the emotions that we're experiencing, being honest with each other in terms of where we find ourselves at, but also the agility, not only in terms of how we market our services or our products, but also our ability to try and adapt to this fast-paced world. We know that there are some elements within what we have experienced in the past that are not necessarily sustainable. If you were to chat to a majority of people, they would be able to start giving you a clear sense of the things that they enjoy about lockdown or the things that they don't enjoy about lockdown. But I would argue right now that outside of our ability to gain a solution oriented focus, we need to be focused on resilience and agility in terms of our personal development skills. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, thank you for that, Carmen. So, yeah, I mean, most of the people and 
almost all the companies are looking at what can go wrong now and and it ties in with the growth mindset and I want to ask you something and maybe maybe this is a difficult question but um, you know I thought about it the last couple of days that what is actually our opportunity as a company as an individual as an employee as a millennial in a in an environment and it in a in a in a in a you know in a place where we are now uh, I, just, I would summarize that it's now our opportunity to shape the future. We really need to grasp this opportunity and the power that we have to also utilize the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. And we need to direct that towards common objectives and values. So it really all comes down to also from a personal perspective, what are our values and how do we shape the future that works for putting people first and empowering them? And at the same time, now is a good time to be reflecting on the, the sustainable development goals that the United Nations has set for 2030. If I think about both areas that we find ourselves within, you know, the quality education, decent work and economic growth, industry, industry innovation and infrastructure, reducing equalities in some form of way and partnerships for goals, I think it is really many of the aspects that we can work towards. And I would really suggest that we find ways to collaborate instead of protecting what we've always known, to find that diverse thinking and being open to opinions of others. I think it's important for us to realize that also from a brain perspective, that often we gravitate towards individuals with similar thinking. They motivate the ideas and give strength to our opinions, but isn't it maybe time for us to listen to the quieter person in the room or to seek out that diverse thinking that stretches our own boundaries, irrespective of how comfortable or uncomfortable we find them to be? Absolutely true. Um, Carmen, yeah, so, so a quick thing, your experience with companies at this stage and, and what, you, what you do with the companies and the business and your relationship with the companies, what do you think are their biggest threat at this stage, except for, um, you know, the kind of obvious thing, but what do you think they are worried about the most for the next um, month or two coming? So I think how this, at this current moment in time, the economic situation is, is definitely a stressor. At the same time, it is the well-being of their employees and dealing with the anxieties that not only the employer, but also the employee is experiencing. I think HR is quite busy at present in these organizations, but I think at the same time, it very much speaks to an organization's willingness to continue to develop the individuals that work within their organizations. So it's about having the heart and really meeting people where they're at. But at the same time, how do we ensure that a business continues to have the growth that is required so that they can market new services in a very disruptive world with consumers that are changing the way that they are behaving in terms of buying patterns? And how do you ensure that you are able to have relationships that in the past you might have been really good at in person and now having to revert back to telephone calls or electronic communication only? And how do we just show up as our authentic selves and be okay with the fact that we are in the position we are today? So I think overall, those are the experiences that I'm having. Um, I'm hearing not now, I guess the question should be rather not yet. How yes. do we collectively start to share the knowledge and the skills that we have to assist organizations and individuals to still move forward during these times? Yeah, no, awesome. I like what you just said um, and it makes sense. You know, it is a, it is a difficult planning year for everybody at this stage. Um, but I think I think you know it's more of a leading leading each other in the right direction because nobody knows what the, this new normal will be and how it will play out. But certainly a lot of opportunities out there, and certainly a, a, a reason for us to sit and just you know revert back and think what 
you know, what is our opportunity and what will be our journey from now to the end of the year or from now a five year journey or 10 year journey. Um, I'm a firm believer that you need to sit now in this time and figure out what will your steps be to still stay relevant as a company. And also, like you just mentioned, how you will get your employees to be relevant and sustainable and, and still build a bigger company. I saw on the social media the other day where Elon Musk and, and Facebook said that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here that we didn't we don't see at the moment, but there will be new, you know, new jobs in the in, 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 in two or three months that we didn't even know or realize can be there. Um, if you look at, at a couple of years back, we didn't even think about um, stuff like cloud computing and, um, you know, network security and all that kind of things. And now it's kind of a necessary thing for a company to have a firewall or a server, you know, or a cloud server and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah, absolutely, Hadus. And I think that when I work very closely with individuals um, on their work readiness, um, within the corporate environment, you also start to realize that, yes, absolutely, technology is changing with times and it's changing at a rapid pace. But it's also very important for us to, to realize that there are some other soft skills, which you referred to earlier, too, that we need to focus on developing. And that's very much where my passion for developing future leaders come into play. To be able to keep up with technology in today's day and age, like you were referring to earlier. If I have to think back to the technology streams that I was introduced to 20 years ago, it is vastly different. And there is opportunity. I guess it's just a question of us being able to see that right now. And how can we shift from that anxiety to being able to find the time and space to think differently? Yes, no, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's, that's actually what we do at this stage where we take a company and, you know, you, you sit and you plan because when you have a plan in place, that anxiety will be less. Even you can, you can, you can, you can rub it out with a, with a nice plan and a journey. And, you know, the no, the no factor, I think is a big part. You know, we sit with companies and we discuss with them what they need is and where they see their company go for the next five years. And then you say, this is your journey map and this is where you are and this is where you need to be. And this is the steps to follow. Either it's your your whole workforce. Uh, we had a company the other day where you know they said we can't get hold of some of the, um, our employees, and they can't. You, we, we can't. You know, it's it's the telephone and it's email, and that's where uh, uh, opportunity comes in, where we create a platform like Teams or like a G Suite or whatever the uh, platform is that you choose, where you can still interactively work and 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 do a cloud comp cloud server where you keep all your files and it's accessible for everybody. So I think that change, and if you start planning that with companies, you can see the light in the eyes and they, they, they see new hope. And I think that's what we as CTU is doing great at this stage. We're bringing the learning to the client and to the company. And we say, let us help you to figure out what you need now that we all didn't know is going to be the future and, and not the future like today and tomorrow. Absolutely. So it's about shifting that paradigm. And I can't think of anybody being in a better position where you're utilizing your, your learnings to be able to take technology and enable organizations to make that shift. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, our hybrid offering is something that um, employees can do from home. And if they just have internet and a, and a, and a device, they are able to get the necessary skill to thrive in such an environment. Um, Carmen, thank you very, very much. I see our time is running out, but thank you very, very much. I really appreciate you joining us for the session. And always nice, um, you know, talking about all this um, subjects and 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 see what what we can do as leaders in the market to help other companies and each other to just focus and 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 creating opportunity. Others, you're welcome. And all the best for the next few weeks and months as, as things start to unfold. And it was great to connect with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerman. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.